The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble. Featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. G'day, how's it going? What do you know, Striker Light? It's been a while, but I was requested to do a recording uh, because the regular host, James, I believe, was uh, on vacation in the Bahamas. Now, that's a, that's a lie, or maybe it's true, I can't quite remember. But regardless, I caught up with Tom. I used to work in the same office as Tom, and he's gone on to become a very successful advisor. And uh, and I've been lost here in the world of uh, pretending to be an entrepreneur. So, I figured it's the tale of two cities, my man. Right. You stuck to it, because <laughs> we're about the same age. You stuck to it. Yep. And uh, and you've bought into this really good business. And then um, when we caught up the other day, I was and you were talking about you're gonna you know buy more and over time yada yada yada. And then when I was asked to do this podcast, I thought, mate, this would be a great discussion to have. So uh, why don't you feel free to introduce yourself, um, the business that you're working at, and we'll get into it. Thanks, Clayton, uh, and good to be here. Thanks for yeah. having me on. Very welcome. Um, as Clayton alluded to, we shared an office. 10-ish years ago mm. over in Martin Place. I still work there. Clayton's gone on to bigger and better things. <laughs> yeah. um, but we bonded and had some good chats during that time we were working together, Yeah, you know, picking apart some of the, the complexities, some of the issues, some of the difficulties we were all struggling with, being young and up and coming and trying to get our feet rolling. Yeah. Um, Clayton <laughs> couldn't sit still and decided <laughs> to move on to something bigger and better. <laughs> but as Clayton said, I've stuck around and uh, just, you know, here and taught us. Uh, we're, we're just <laughs> going forward that way. Um, what's kind of cool is like all of my mates that have stuck at it have done- Both of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you and one other guy. Uh, have done really well in the advice space. And it's one of those things I kind of look at it <clears throat> and I'm like, oh my God, like if I'd only just stuck around- uh, there's, you know, there's you, there's Benny Nash, um, Phil Thompson down at, down in Melbourne. These got like, you guys have, have gone on to do some really impressive things. And as financial planning has changed over those 10 years, what I'm kind of seeing, and you might, you might agree or you might not, but it's essentially headed down a path of there is high net worth, high net wealth. And it's moving into like a scale game. And right. and on the high net wealth side, um, it's moving into, uh, you know, out asset consultancy um, and a, a lot of accountancy in a lot of cases. And now on the scale side, it's like technology. Um, robo advice. Robo advice, that kind of thing, right? So where you, you know, where you where your company sits, it's really at that top end, right? Um, do you guys call that like ultra high net worth, or like what what's the terminology that you use? Private or yeah, it's we're not out there um, walking up and down the pavement saying we're <laughs> ultra high net wealth, but right. I guess what we would be would call ourselves would be a private wealth firm. Um, right, we don't look after many clients, yeah, um, but we look after them well. We know them very well. Yeah. Um, we do a lot for them. Um, and a lot of what we do is on the investment and strategic piece. Okay? Yes. So um, the business had its origins coming out of PwC some 20 odd years ago um, when ironically after what's happened recently, they wanted to separate advice from audit mm. and 
subsequently, the business has gone through a number of iterations to where it where it sits today. Being a private wealth firm, focused on um, private clients who, who happen to have um, significant wealth behind them. And from from as early as I can remember, you guys have had the the in house or, or or outsource, depending on how you want to refer to it, but. The asset consultancy piece. Sure. That, that's that been something that I remember. You guys were the like, first that I'd ever come across sure. that were doing that. Um, so without a doubt, uh, investments have always been such a super and key part of your of, of the offering. Mm-hmm. Um, when you say strategy, I'm interested to know like with your client base, is there a particular type of client that you guys look after? Or is it just a case of assets under management? Because when you get into strategy, mm. obviously, like the better acquainted you are with a particular type of niche, for example, you're sometimes in a better position to be able to advise on it. So do you guys like sp- stick to a niche or is it just an asset size kind of thing? There's nothing explicit as to the types of clients that we right. work with, but we do um- – we're not the cheapest firm out there, right. or are we the most expensive? Yep. But I'd say for every five client, five people who might make a call and say they're interested in maybe being a client, maybe one might come on board. Right. Um, yeah, right. Two or three, we might refer off to another advisor who we trust and um, yeah. have referred work successfully to, and then one might just fall, fall off by the wayside. Right. Um, but by definition, even if it's like explicit. There is a, a assets under management that we look at yes. um, before it's probably worthwhile or worthwhile both from our sense, but yep. also from the client who's making a pretty significant investment in their family's life, in their life yes. um, by coming on board as a client. Yep. Now, the office is full of really smart guys, right? How the hell did you end up? No, no, I'm, I'm being facetious, but like you were- you. you you sort of, you know, like if you go back 10 years and even further, we were in our 20s and yep. and uh, that was always kind of, you know, somehow you were plucked out from the masses oh. to, get to go into the, how, how, like what did you study at uni? How, what, what was the connection? How did you end up in that office? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a bit of a roundabout story, but I graduated with a law degree, a law and finance degree in 2008. Right. Um. We, where really the only thing I knew was I didn't want to be a lawyer at that stage. <laughs> um, my father-in-law was a lawyer. I could see how stressed he was. Right. What my now father-in-law, um, yeah. it wasn't for me, um, but that was pretty much all I knew at that point in time. Uh, then 2008, the GFC came along, yeah. um, which made things quite interesting and difficult to secure a job for a new grad. Absolutely. You would might relate. Yeah, to that. I, I, yeah, went through the exact same thing. Yeah, the, the you know the job market was entirely different to what it uh, where it is today. Totally. Um, so that was that was a challenge, and I found almost through a bit of fear that there weren't going to be any jobs, but a bit of a uh, I'll call it a boiler room type uh, role where I lasted say three to six months. Yeah, right. Hated it. <laughs> um, I was stressed. Uh, wasn't making a difference. Didn't enjoy the people I was working with. Could see that it was the clients weren't probably enjoying that. Yeah. Um, and just knew that I needed to get out of there sooner rather than later. Um, I just happened to be going on a ski holiday to Japan, uh, February 2009, and and was literally sitting on a chairlift um, next to an advisor. It got speaking to him. He said, "Why don't you come and have a coffee when you get back into Sydney?" And uh, that's where it landed. 16 years later, that's no way. That's now my business partner. And yeah. You so guys met on a ski lift. I knew him indirectly, but that's right. where the first conversation came <laughs> through there. Um, so yeah, good story. I, I went from there and I didn't go straight into advising by right. any stretch. I, I say I started at the photocopier machine, but <laughs> from there I worked my way up. Um, and now Ian's my business partner. Yeah. And potentially retiring in the next couple of years, and 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 I'm the natural succession for him and his uh, his business. Mate, his yeah. part of the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's a couple of other uh, shareholders, right? So sure. Yeah. Yep. You, yeah. Stick around and continue. Yeah. So the business is owned by the four directors, myself, yep. Ian included, yep. and, and two others. Yep. Um, uh, Jonathan, who's an advisor, um, and he started the business out of PwC. 
and also a fellow by the name of Ray Jarney, who isn't an advisor um, per se, but really sits and drives the, he runs the business as managing director, can see where the opportunities are, yes. what we need to work on, what can be improved, can help manage things like the back office and the compliance aspect of the, of the business um, and really take the load off the client-facing advisors um, and just do the difficult task that <laughs> I'm not necessarily wanting to get out of bed every morning to do. Well, it's kind of interesting, right? Because, and that's one of the things you would almost call that layer, the management layer, right? Which which a lot of kind of bigger financial planning practices have. They have a, they have a, a layer of that running the business sure. side of owning a financial planning business. Oh, Ray's got a corporate background. He has run licensees in the past. For his next role, he wanted to be doing something a little bit more intimate and he joined us in 2014, 15. Yeah. Doing a bit of consulting to see how we could actually improve the business. Um, he wrote a strategic plan for us and, and, and turned around and presented it to the directors and the directors basically looked at Ray and said, well, who's going to implement that? <laughs> and Ray said, well, probably me. Um, and... From there, he's he's joined the business, has acquired some equity, and helps run the business on a day to day. Um, it's in, and that's it. Is that his full time job? Does he do other correct? Things? Correct. For- he was consulting uh, when he came yep. across to us, but now his full time role is managing director of our Excellent. business. He provides me with uh, a great level of uh, encouragement. Um, yeah. He helps me with my career. It's yeah. been a fantastic resource to bounce ideas off. Yes. Um, sometimes it can be a little Jack Russell nipping at you to do the little jobs that you've tried to uh, push to the wayside, yeah. um, performance reviews and stuff like that. <laughs> but ultimately, he's got the firm, my best interests at hearts. And yeah. the, um, really, you look back at where the business was 10 years ago, 15 years ago or 20 years ago um, before I joined and mm. the great success has really come through in the last decade or so. Yeah, that's... When we, you know, let's let's assume at some point in the future, you mm-hmm. know, you you're you've completely taken over, for, you know, your part of the the business, right? Sure. Do you think the strategy changes much in the sense of the world is moving kind of to these hyper financial planning firms, right? You're getting a lot of M and A out there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of kind of growth target trajectories going on. Lots of investment, um, or do you see sort of a, a a unique competitive advantage to stay in your lane, which is kind of the the maybe slower moving but more exclusive play? Do you do you stay? Do you keep the advantage? Do you tinker with it? What yeah. the the more control that you get over this company, especially because you've been in it so long. Do you see keeping things the way they are or, or do you see taking it in a particular direction? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question and something that we've really given some thought over the last year or so because I think if you're, if you're standing still, you're going backwards in our game. You know, just the, 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 the costs of running the business are growing substantially each and every year. So we need to be bringing on, you know, a number, not too many, but the right and a number of clients each year to, to be you know, standing still effectively. Yeah. Um, I also think that advice is turning into a bit of a scale game. I don't, I don't know how the um, the sole operator, sole advisor with maybe power, power planner or a couple back office um, can do it. I certainly couldn't and hats off to the ones that can make it work. But yeah. I think it's incredibly difficult um, dealing with the challenges around compliance and, and running a back office and making sure everything is um, okay from a legal perspective it, it is a challenge. Um Fortunately, in my case, we've got enough of a back office there that I don't need to be personally worrying about when my FDS is ready. I've got a resource there who will have it prepared and ready and up to date, <laughs> ideally, um, for the meeting. Yeah. Um, if you're on your own, it, that would be a challenge, I'd, I'd say. It was, yeah. I remember um, for the first kind of six to 12 months before I had any staff, it was just me. Yeah, it was one of those questions like, ah, oh, an FTS. Oh, there was, a, there, was an F, there was an update, you know. We've got to put that extra paragraph in. 
Um, and then, I, yeah, I had, I think by the time that I'd sold the company, I was, I was two, two offshore and one in the office. So there's four of us at that stage. Yep. One was just doing client acquisition. Mm-hmm. And this is before I even knew how to do proper client acquisition. Um, uh, you know, I'd run a Facebook campaign, which would send people to a, a landing page and all this. Um, You'd have a lot of Google leads at that stage. Google leads and things like that. Yeah. Because it wasn't as competitive in that purchased environment. There was still pretty good bang for buck, especially if you're, you know, I think my service offering at that stage was, I think about 5,000 up front or something like that. And, and maybe five to 10,000 ongoing for, for a complicated client. And so if you were paying, you know, like two, even $2,000 for, to get all the way through to a lead, that was, that was, you know, substantial, substantial, right? Like uh, it was certainly paying for itself. So yeah, there was had offshore client acquisition, um, onshore. How many clients were you? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think I got up to about 50. Right. And I was, I was kind of at the stage where I was, I mean, the reason why I sold is because I'd grown a business and it, it actually has a lot to do with Ensemble at the time. It was called XY Advisor. And, um, I sort of started the business in the only way that I was brought up to do, which was purchase it from, um, like or an orphan client book, right? Like that was really, unless you went through your process, which you're going through, which is, you know, a very good process, but it's the, a much slower burn. Though. It's, it's, it's a slower burn, but also like it's, it's, I mean, let's face it, like it's hard to yep. find a good place that is willing to do that. Right. So, um, when it does work, it's excellent, but it's, it's hard to get that. So, the way that I was sort of, it was more, it was more a sure thing in terms of being able to at least start the journey, yep. but certainly not a sure thing in order to continue it. And so I sort of bought this orphan book um, of clients and I was going through and sort of converting them into full-time uh, or, or, or full-service clients. Um, at the same time, I was sort of doing client acquisition and I'd gotten to the stage where I started to fire my less revenue, you know, the, the clients that I'd had kind of in the first month, in the first six months. Um, and I was at that stage and I realized that the business that I wanted wasn't the business I had. Right. And that was because in the kind of the four years between starting and selling that I'd started with one set of belief system or, or, or one sort of idea on how to run a company or how to grow a financial planning uh, practice. But then after spending four years with this, what we call ensemble now, and learning about what everyone was doing and how it could be done, hell, working out of the same office as you guys, yep. I realized that I'd sort of had this kind of, beyond the 50 clients that I was looking at, you know, one-on-one, I had like this big book of orphan clients that I, I just didn't want. And didn't know what to do. Yeah. and And I realized that, um, I, I was kind of, I kind of needed to start again. Yes. Uh, f- and then, and then at that stage, you know, once I'd kind of decided that I wanted to start again, I was like, well, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to go out and really try and be a- an entrepreneur. And then that's when the idea of other things sort of started creeping into my mind. I'm like, I want to stay in financial services. And then the first thing was uh, a super fund. Yes, I went down that path. I remember that that idea. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a great idea, but eighteen months in, I actually had a couple of VCs want to invest because at that time it was um, it was it was like an you know, like you know, and the numbers were all right. But by the time I really crunched the numbers, I mean like eighteen months in, I realized it wasn't going to work. Not. Um, because high level, it looks like it'll work, but then when you're once you've done all the due diligence, once you've gone through every single supply, like part of the supply chain with a super fund, and once you realize where all the issues are and costs on top of what you expect the cost to be. Now, that's a scale game. That is it's definitely a scale game, but I realized that you would go broke before you got there. Yes. Unless you had like American money, like here's $50 million or whatever, which is just not 
what people do in Australia. And um, and funnily enough, at the same time this was happening, do you remember Sargon? I think that was the name of it. They were down in Melbourne. No, I don't. Oh, okay, right. So, so um, PayPal's co-founder, essentially co-founder along with Elon Musk, was is a guy called Teal. Teal, yeah. So, Teal invested a bunch of money in this um, Australian company called right. Sargon. Okay. And they went through and purchased like OneView. Um, they purchased a uh, Madison licensee. Um, they purchased a lot of things and then it went bankrupt. And right. so, it ended up getting picked apart and Teal was out long before it went bankrupt. But that's, it was, I mean, I, the only reason why I feel even remotely okay with that kind of wild 18 months journey <laughs> was that even Teal <laughs> went, got sucked into what looks like a really good business model, but then the more you go into it, you're like, wait a second, it's, it's not. It's difficult. Um, yeah. 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 Elon could have done it though. He, mate, Elon could do anything. I was watching this thing on him last night about he, he wants to send out a hundred, he wants to do a hundred flights a day in the next 20 years. He wants to get to a hundred flights a day. That's insane. But anyway, we'll, we'll see. Um, so, long story short. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we get up to Elon? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it was, I realized I needed to uh, start again. And it was during that process that I sold. And, um, but it's, but, and then ultimately, uh, Superfund didn't work. And uh, at, at precisely that time, Roxy came along and offered us a little bit of money and kind of kicked this thing off. And it's five, yeah, five years in now of this, which is cool. Yep. Recording podcast with your old uh, <laughs> landlord. <laughs> 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 yeah, mate. So, um, okay. So, what? Where then does your decision making process go in terms of? Do you look to potentially offer, like, extend the the style of financial planning advice that you give, or do you maybe open up the window so that more of the one in fives come through? Or how do you? No, you no I think we're, we're pretty clear with where our niche is and what we right. do well. Yep. Um, we're not going to sacrifice that just to bring on more clients because then that will dilute the service and offering that we give to our existing clients. We're pretty pretty protective of that. And we're still yep. still finding enough clients that would fit our target and uh, bringing them on board. We shake the tree, enough enough will fall out. Mm -hmm. um, but it was in, I was interested to ask how many clients you had at that stage. You said 50. I think I'd have less than 20 clients personally myself today wow and maybe when my ski buddy retires in a few years time that might double or triple to 50 or 60 clients so it's not many clients but wow. we're seeing them you know four four times more than that I might be even speaking to them weekly or or fortnightly um, right it's very personal touch yes um and you know the the support we have with the amount of staff we've got i think we've got one staff for every 11 or 12 clients, which is quite unique in yeah. the broader industry. Yeah. Um, consequently, I think you can do the maths and work out well, what, what type of client we need to take on yeah. uh, to make that kind of model work. Now, not saying, not saying that it works for everyone, um, but it works for us and, you know, we've been here for 23 years. I'd like to think we're here for another 23 years Yeah. Um, because I think we'd, we do what we do pretty well. Um, I'm interested to to sort of find out what do you what do you we'll get to client acquisition, which sure. I think would be super fun to 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 jump into. But before we do that, I'd love to know what an ongoing service looks like. Yeah, sure. Yeah. What does an ongoing service? Well, what am I? Let's say I'm a client, right? Mm -hmm. We're catching up at least every 13 weeks. Yes. Yep. Potentially more. Right. Basically, it's uh, what, what are we what are we discussing? What is do you do you kind of like etch out projects, or and with and and you're discussing certain parts of their strategy over certain periods of time, and then and then maybe there's a lull in between projects, or how do you kind of approach it? Y yes and no. Obviously, not every client is the same, and there's some clients yeah. where they're happy with a, a review meeting every quarter or every four months, and we. Yep 
go in, we look at the portfolio, we look at what we need to do from a uh, strategy perspective, be it around organized uh, and liaise with their tax advisor around contributions, pension strategies, structuring, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. But for then some other clients who it might be a bit more full service, um, we would produce or it'd be like a personal CFO where we would have their own investment committee related to that client with uh, an asset consultant that might be helping to draft an investment charter that provides direction and governance around a pot of money that the client has, a significant pot, and how that might last them for generations and beyond. Um, special projects might then involve looking at the ESG overlay of their underlying portfolio and how that um, how that looks, or it might look at what's the overall liquidity of their portfolio because the the types of investments we we have in the portfolio wouldn't just be the vanilla, you know, cash ETFs, bonds, managed funds, etc. There's also a fair bit of alternatives in there that that may um, have a fair bit of complexity around them, um, both from an understanding perspective, but also liquidity. And, and truly understanding what the driver of the return from that part of the portfolio looks like. So, what 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 percentage would would be in alternatives? Oh, again, how average. Is, how is a piece of string? But ah, <laughs> uh, look, some of the more wholesale clients that could be pushing up twenty twenty five percent might be looking in in what I call true alternatives. Yep. Um, not necessarily uh, where where we've got some illiquidity premium. Ah. Uh, and there's also a fair bit of, um, and this is a, this is a challenge we're going through at the moment is, is is what is actually an alternative. Now I've always defined it as not something, listed. Oh no, something that doesn't derive its return from equity markets or bond markets. Right. Okay. Now a market neutral or a long short manager might classify themselves as an alternative manager, but really you've got a investment manager there just making a call on um, direction on how much beta to have relative to the market. Yeah. We would much prefer an alternative, which is actually a true alternative, be it like a global transport offering or a, a, a I don't know, something with a bit more, a, a global macro fund where it's it's systematic and, and not tied to an investment manager making a decision around, you know, the direction of a certain market. Right. Um how often are clients coming to you with their own alternative investments that they want in their portfolio? Oh, n- not huge, not 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 particularly often, okay. um, but often enough. And <laughs> I think we've got the uh, the skills, the support, the contacts to be able to do a true um, deep dive on an asset and provide some unbiased, uh, informed advice on you know what is the true risk of this investment you're bringing why are you bringing it because you yeah. waited at the golf club um and your mates invest and done you know his golfing mate may have invested and, and done really well out of it but do you, does he truly understand what the risk of this investment might be and we can provide some direction and steer and uh, provide a, a framework for making a decision as to whether it's the right investment or not wow so is that is that an essentially an offering that you guys? Oh, have? not explicitly, right? No, okay, but you know, if a client is paying us a fair bit of money, we yeah. want to be able to um, be a sounding board for what may or may not be a good idea for their portfolio. Interesting. And would you would would you, I mean, personally sit down and look at that, or would you out would you reach out to oh, maybe no. some VC friends or, or PE on, or? on the first first run? Okay. I would have I would might have a quick look at it and yeah. You know, it might be a very quick, not might be very quick to make a decision as to whether it's something that's worthwhile or not. Um, yes, but you alluded to the fact that around our managed account uh, that's been going almost nine years now. Um, yeah, we've got uh, several asset consultants and a third party independent chair to provide some governance and framework around the investment decision making. Multiple there. asset consultants. That's correct. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's that's been a recent change, but it's been an important and we think beneficial change to the the structure of our our managed account. Which that seems very independent, right? 
It does. There, there, there can be a lot of chiefs around a table. <laughs> I could respect. imagine. But we've, we've been very clear and explicit as to what the defined roles are of each input into the investment committee. Right. Okay. So we have an investment at asset consultant purely to provide advice on asset allocation. Yep. And then another asset consultant to provide advice on fund selection. Wow. And then- the third party chair to provide to bring it all together, help us up it's the right right questions, move us forward if there's a handbrake or we're getting tied up in in knots. Um, but from that, we've created a structure which we think is providing a pretty good framework for uh, client portfolios um, going forward. That's amazing. How much how much um, say or how much influence do you? as an individual advisor over your clients, sure. how much say do you have in their portfolio, considering you got your managed account, sure. right? Is it 100% the managed account or is is there, again, it's probably how long is a piece of string, but like what what's sort of an average, how, where do you end up? Okay, well, on a straight fund basis, a managed account might make up a bit less than half of our overall total fund. Right. Um, there's reasons there. Um, yep. Liquidity uh, being the main one, it needs to be daily li- liquid. So that strikes off a lot of the illiquid assets, which we like to dampen volatility and provide uh, a different string to the bow or a different uh, provider of returns for the portfolio. Yes. A client may also have brought with them a whole bunch of assets with significant CGT implications. So we can sit there, provide advice on them, but the best advice may be just to keep that BHP that they've owned for 30 odd years and is providing a pretty stable dividend, or pretty stable, um, pretty good dividend yeah. stream yep. uh, longer term. Or a client might, might also have a whole bunch of term deposits providing a pretty decent uh, core income return that just cascades and rolls off each month just to fund what they need from a liquidity uh, basis as well. So that managed account structure would be caught 40% of our overall. Right. That's so interesting. And then, so let's let's say on average, you have a 60% portfolio to, to, to deal with in, in terms of your client. Yes. You're then talking to them. You've obviously got your own your own sort of APL, call it for lack of a better term, your, your own model portfolio that you, you, sure. you've got a list for. Who are you discussing that list with? Do you, do, you dis- do you have individual discussions with some of your asset consultant mates? Do you just share and amongst your, your, the other planners within your office? Are you talking to Ray about it? Like, wh- um, or do you just talk to your client? Do you just do your own research? Like, how do you approach the, uh, the other half? Yeah, so we've got a licensee and an <laughs> APL there, which we need to – Follow, yep. as most advisors should or do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's that's the starting building block. Um, there, then there would also be a a, a lot of internal discussion. Um, you know, a, a particular client may want to have um, more global equities outside of the managed account because they've got a big rump of BHP. If we pick on BHP again, yeah. Um, so we may add to the specific global equity options that we already have within the managed account or we may find find a fund that complements it from a style basis or they might have a particular interest in building up the, the growth factor or value factor or momentum factor. And we, we can either add to that via via funds or or ETFs. And you know, ETFs are playing a pretty big role at the moment as well. Yeah. As a cheap and cheerful way of um, getting factor exposure quickly in into a client's portfolio. I, I was just actually, I had a memory of uh, I, the number of asset <clears throat> um, sort of BDMs yes. that used to call me up. Um, and it dawned on me after a couple of years that the only reason I was so popular is because I shared an office with you guys. <laughs> huh. So, what they, would, what they would do is they'd say, Clay, no, we'll, I'll come take you for lunch. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's, you don't have to do that. They're like, we want to. And then they'd come to the office and they'd spend the first five minutes just trying to speak to one of you guys and they'd be like, okay, I guess I'll take Clayton. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a role or a profession that would not suit everyone and I'm not sure it's something that I could do. Uh, you yeah, have to deal with a lot of, uh, lot of no's. Uh, 
uh, you know, keep pounding the pavement in that profession. Um, and it's become more difficult in recent years with the rise of the asset consultant. Yeah. Where, you know, they might only need to have 30 conversations a year rather than 16,000 and advisors out there or however many that's there are right year. yeah and they're also competing with the uh the old index uh landscape as well so yeah, yeah it's, it's it that is one of the remarkable things that has happened to to the um to the profession as a whole what what did you i'm not sure if you saw this but there was a i won't i won't mention any names but within a media organization there was an article and in the article it talked about one of the asset consultants receiving some investment and the way that it was sort of almost kind of alluding to was that by an advisor outsourcing their investment selection to an asset consultant, they were actually almost taking a piece of the value of their company and outsourcing. And I thought, well, I mean, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it would just be, you know, you just got to serve, you know, you're just paying someone like your, your accounting you know, you outsource your accounting, it doesn't make your company worth less. Yes. So, hey, has, has that concept sort of, because you guys are one of the OGs with <laughs> using asset consultants, has that ever been a topic that's ever been? Oh, 2015, 2016, when we started to put this all together, I was wondering, well, does our role become somewhat redundant? And I think, if anything, no. Yeah. It just deepens our understanding and what we can provide and explain to a client as to why you know this this fund over here or this investment idea is performed in this way we will have an actual um you know if the client wants it reams of paperwork saying yeah. you know this is the reason rather than you know it's gone up because of this this factor or trump said this so to speak, so to speak. <laughs> yeah um no it, it, yeah um you you mentioned before uh, with ETFs and then alternatives. Yes, I've got, I've got a uh, I've got a controversial one for you. Here we go. <clears throat> Bitcoin. Bitcoin. That's they're in ETFs now. They are. Does that ever does that ever come up with uh, your your size of client? No. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's been raised. Oh, okay. Clients. Right. Um, no, it hasn't met the investment threshold. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've always preferred to own the picks and shovels in the in the mining boom uh, rather than hang your head on Bitcoin or whatever coin is flavor of the month right now. Yeah. I think I'm doing a lot of reading, understanding blockchain and, and the yeah. implications of what is a pretty interesting piece of technology, but who's going to be the winner there? I, and I always use this analogy that in the early 90s when the internet first came about, um, you could tell it was going to change the world. And mm. change the way we did things. Yes. But the two biggest companies then were Yahoo and um <laughs> <Ask> o- Jeeves. <laughs> <laughs> no, AO- AOL. Oh, right, yeah. Both of whom don't really exist in a meaningful way anymore. Yeah. Um in the early nineties, if you would have had a bet that who's gonna win out of the internet, <laughs> it wouldn't have been an Uber or an Airbnb or whoever. Yeah. Which didn't exist back then. Absolutely. You would have said Yahoo. Now, is Bitcoin <clears throat> No, that's a very good point. Is Bitcoin AOL, for example? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very good point. Oh, I'm but- sure of your many listers, you're going to have some uh, <laughs> Bitcoin junkies just yes. call me out on that. But <laughs> we, I, I personally don't think I've got the the sure. the binary decision. Is Bitcoin going to be the one or not? Yeah. I don't know. I prefer yeah. to own, if a client wants or has that risk appetite, I prefer to own a, uh, you know, a structural... What is it? Uh, in, vi- in, in the video. video. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they're the ones that create the GPUs. They're the picks and shovels. It's, and that would have been a- shovel. Not perfectly yeah. analogous, but that is- well, well, The, the train thing. tracks. Yeah. Correct. So, I mean, yeah, they've killed it, right? And and because it's- Well, now it's getting used in AI as well. So, it's like- This yeah. is not financial advice. It's dead. <laughs> yeah, dead it's, dead. it's dead. I mean, the, the, the boom has already hit it. So, if you're going for it now, it's a- um, So- well, it, on on that blo- and, and we'll move off it really quickly. But just on the blockchain technology, the, I've thought about it as you could imagine. I've thought about it quite a lot, and I think the best analogy that I've ever come up with is uh, it's scale. It, it's scarcity with scalability. And what I mean by that is, if I take the twenty-one million, whatever it is. Well, well, no, no, no. So if I take so just the blockchain in general, like so not you, not as Bitcoin. I mean, just as the technology. 
So if I send you an email with an with a word attachment, and let's say I've created the word uh, file on my computer, there's only one copy of that word file. Yes. Now I email it to you. Now there's two there's two copies of that word oh. file, right? And the reason why we do this is because it's scalable. It's easy. I can flick it across and it saves me having to print it out and send it in the mail. So there's still only one. With a, if I was to send that document via a blockchain yes. and it was a blockchain file, yep. there would it would leave my computer and it would go to so so it's scarcity with scalability. So and it's a very good point. Like it will change oh well blockchain no doubt no doubt which coin yeah but how and when i think is a is a very good and valid point i think we're still trying to figure it out in fact hilariously when i was a financial planner um and this is even if we go all the way back to darling harbor when we're sharing office down there well, you uh, know there were you yeah 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 i, I, I remember yeah. used to do long walks along the uh, promenade <laughs> exactly <laughs> 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 but um the uh I remember there was a company even all the way back then that would allow you to receive payment in Bitcoin and it would immediately convert into cash. Yes. Right. So I actually signed up for it. And I, as far as I'm aware, I was the very first financial player in the world that could get paid in Bitcoin. No one ever did. And you're like, you lost the key. And- <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, the, the issue was um, getting it, the cash through through the uh, the licensee. So it had to sell anyway. So it wasn't even, it was just a gimmicky thing, right? I, it was getting quote unquote paid in Bitcoin, but really it was just getting paid in cash. And there's, so there's one last question I got. So five calls come in, yep. one drops off, three get referred out, one becomes a client. So, so it's nearly 100% of the clients that we work with would have come from a, a referral from an existing client. That was my, going to be my question. How do you attract? And it's it's literally two two people playing golf on the golf course. One says, "Yep, have you spoken to my advisor? He's great." So the obviously there's a bit of a vetting process already in that they know the types of clients we work with. Right. They can give a bit of a idea of what we do. Right. Um, what kind of fees we might charge. Yes. They might not know their personal circumstances to the nth degree, but they've got a fair idea if they're, you know, which golf club they're working, <laughs> they're playing at, et cetera. Yes. And, and from that, we will we might have, you know, a number of phone calls or a number of meetings where we, you know, see if we can work together. It's a pretty, yeah. pretty big call to make. Um, and yeah. ideally, it's a 10, 20, 30-year relationship. Um, yeah. So we want to get that right. And we want to make sure that the, you know, what the client's, looking to achieve is is also something that we can deliver. The, the, the client that wants to, you know, double their money every five years, not our style. Or the client wants to talk a trade, trade, trade shares regularly, not our style either. We're, we're all about buying good investments, holding them for the medium to longer term and allowing them to compound and, and grow in that way. Yes. Fantastic. Well, mate, it's been great to actually – Oh, I wanted to ask you a bit about AI. If you, Maybe, yeah, go for it. No. Yeah, yeah, go. So, let's let's have a quick word about AI because <laughs> I just got back from the states where I've been in a conference um, in Texas. Yep, with a bunch of about 20, 20 advisors. Um, right, South by um, where the all the talk was AI and what it's going to change, um, how it's coming, how quickly it's coming. Yep, that was an evangelical being Texas. Uh, <laughs> uh, AI adherence or first movers. Yep. Um, what do you say at the moment and yeah. how's that well, coming it's, to fruition? It's um it's the average intelligence of the average person. So which is great. At, at the moment. At the moment. At the moment. So over the next kind of over the next sort of ten or twenty years, it'll be smarter than all intelligence combined. But at the moment The age of singularity, that sort yeah, of piece. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the moment it's it's as smart as um an average person. So to me, it's it's just a time saver. It it is you know I can I can put multiple documents into an AI and get a summary of it. I can I can find data points really quickly. I can get it's made googling kind of irrelevant. Like I've already I, I already I I chat GPT everything now. Like why would I bother going to look for information that was written at some point in the past that isn't perfectly contextualized to my exact need that I have right now. Right. Which which I can I can just get a better result 
Um, but so you're not using Google at all? I basically don't use Google. So yeah. chat GPT, everything, you know, if I got a question, I, I'm just going to ask a person of average intelligence that just knows everything. Right, so um, so I, the the language that it uses is very un- easily easily to understand, and it just has a huge database of knowledge, right? Um, and its ability to to synthesize information is about an average intelligence person. So that's sort of how I use it on on the day to day. But then on on the business side, uh, in, you know, in our company, that's what we've been focused on for the last couple of years. And um, yeah, I basically the purpose for us as a company is to take the conversations that are happening on the platform and turn it into research as a service for for product providers and tech providers to build better products and tech for advisors. Right. Um, and that's yeah, we're really proud about that. And are you worried, or do you, how well do you understand where your data is ending up? Like no, because we, we use the Microsoft Suite. Yeah, Microsoft so it's Suite. Totally locked down. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we don't. Yeah, I don't put chat GPT. Yeah, I don't put any sensitive thing inside of chat GPT. If I if I want to know how many cans of coke I can fit inside the center point tower, I'll ask chat GPT that. But I'm not going to put any client, any confidential, any advisor piece of um, information within that. It's just how I use it for my day to day life. On the business side of things, everything's within Microsoft. They, they've got the competitive advantage of making sure that you keep your data. Tell tell me how you're actually using Copilot like on a day to day. How we use Copilot on day to day? It's just to make sense of large amounts of information. So um, we've got a report coming out relatively soon called "What Advisors Want." Uh, it allows us to take all the conversations that are happening on the platform, run it through. You know, it it might be something as simple as what do private wealth advisors uh, in Sydney think about in terms of insurance, right? All right. Now, there might not be a lot of information about that, but there may be uh, a a set of conversations where uh, that avatar has maybe uh, not said or done anything, but maybe clicked on and viewed a lot of, Yep. right? So, we know that, uh, okay, well, this is for that avatar, that's a a point of interest, right? So, that's how how we, so we don't, and as, as I've said a million times on this podcast, we don't share any personal details. We don't share names. We don't say, Tom is saying this. Yep. We'll say- you know, we'll, we'll take anything that you do on the platform, hide it in amongst hundreds or maybe thousands of other advisors, take all the names out, and then that becomes research. Yeah. So, what what Macquarie used to pay Deloitte for? Consulting. You know, five hundred thousand dollars takes six months to get a report, and they use a paragraph out of it. They, you know, they can lean on us. We're much more specialized, much more specific, um, and you know, our business is designed to be to to complement the advice profession rather than kind of try to just make money from it. And where do you see that leading the advice profession? Inverted commas, if you can call it that. Yeah, yeah. 10 years. Well, I think, think about how far advice has come in the last 10 years, you know. I I, I think we played a small role in it, hopefully more than a small role, you know, like we've, and I think that there's a lot more to do around the world. So, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty pumped for it.